Thank you very much for coming to listen to the latest story read on the Black Dog Chronicles. Don't forget it will greatly help if you push the like button. Don't be afraid to leave a comment and let me know what you think of this story. If you haven't already, please share this story with your friends and subscribe. Don't forget to ring the notification bell so you never miss out on a story from the Black Dog Chronicles. And now, on with our story. Casting the Runes by M. R. James Part 1 of 2 Read by Hugh Carr April the 15th, 19... Dear Sir, I am requested by the Council of the... Association to return to you the draft of a paper on The Truth of Alchemy, which you have been good enough to offer to read at our forthcoming meeting, and to inform you that the Council do not see their way to including it in the programme. Yours faithfully, Secretary. April 18th. Dear Sir, I am sorry to say that my engagements do not permit of my affording you an interview on the subject of your proposed paper, nor do our laws allow of your discussing the matter with the committee of our council, as you suggest. Please allow me to assure you that the fullest consideration was given to the draft which you submitted, and that it was not declined without having been referred to the judgment of a most competent authority. No personal question, it can hardly be necessary for me to add, can have had the slightest influence on the decision of the council. Believe me, ut supra. April 20th. The secretary of the association, begs respectfully to inform Mr. Carswell that it is impossible for him to communicate the name of any person or persons to whom the draft of Mr. Carswell's paper may have been submitted, and further desires to intimate that he cannot undertake to reply to any further letters on this subject. And who is Mr. Carswell? inquired the secretary's wife. She had called at his office and, perhaps unwarrantably, had picked up the last of these three letters which the typist had just brought in. Why, my dear, just at present Mr. Carswell is a very angry man, but I don't know much about him otherwise, except that he is a person of wealth, his address is Lufford Abbey, Warwickshire, and he's an alchemist, apparently, and wants to tell us all about it. That's about all, except that I don't want to meet him for the next week or two. Now, if you're ready to leave this place, I am. What have you been doing to make him angry? asked Mrs. Secretary. The usual thing, my dear, the usual thing. He sent in a draft of a paper he wanted to read at the next meeting, and we referred it to Edward Dunning, almost the only man in England who knows about these things, and he said it was perfectly hopeless, so we declined it. So, Carswell has been pelting me with letters ever since. The last thing he wanted was the name of the man we referred his nonsense to. You saw my answer to that. But don't you say anything about it, for goodness sake. I should think not, indeed. Did I ever do such a thing? I do hope, though, that he won't get to know it was poor Mr. Dunning. Poor Mr. Dunning? I don't know why you call him that. He's a very happy man, is Dunning. Lots of hobbies and a comfortable home, and all his time to himself. I only meant I should be sorry for him if this man got hold of his name and came and bothered him. Oh, oh, yes, I dare say he would be poor Mr. Dunning then. The secretary and his wife were lunching out, and the friends to whose house they were bound were Warwickshire people. So Mrs. Secretary had already settled it in her own mind that she would question them judiciously about Mr. Carswell. But... She was saved the trouble of leading up to the subject, for the hostess said to the host, before many minutes had passed, "'I saw the abbot of Lufford this morning,' the host whistled. "'Did you? What in the world brings him up to town?' "'Goodness knows. He was coming out of the British Museum gate as I drove past.' 
It was not unnatural that Mrs. Secretary should inquire whether this was a real abbot who was being spoken of. Oh, no, my dear, only a neighbour of ours in the country who bought Lufford Abbey a few years ago. His real name is Carswell. Is he a friend of yours? asked Mr. Secretary with a private wink to his wife. The question let loose a torrent of declamation. There was really nothing to be said for Mr. Carswell. Nobody knew what he did with himself. His servants were a horrible set of people. He invented a new religion for himself and practiced no one could tell what appalling rites. He was very easily offended and never forgave anybody. He had a dreadful face, so the lady insisted, her husband somewhat demurring. He never did a kind action, and whatever influence he did exert was mischievous. Do the poor man justice, dear, the husband interrupted. You forget the treat he gave the school children. Forget it indeed, but I'm glad you mentioned it, because it gives an idea of the man. Now, Florence, listen to this. The first winter he was at Lufford, this delightful neighbour of ours wrote to the clergyman of his parish. He's not ours, but we know him very well, and offered to show the school children some magic lantern slides. He said he had some new kinds, which he thought would interest them. Well, the clergyman was rather surprised because Mr. Carswell had shown himself inclined to be unpleasant to the children, complaining of their trespassing or something of the sort. But of course he accepted, and the evening was fixed, and our friend went himself to see that everything went right. He said he never had been so thankful for anything as that his own children were all prevented from being there. They were at a children's party at our house, as a matter of fact. Because this Mr. Carswell had evidently set out with the intention of frightening these poor village children out of their wits. And I do believe if he had been allowed to go on, he would actually have done so. He began with some comparatively mild things. Red Riding Hood was one, and even then Mr. Farrow said the wolf was so dreadful that several of the smaller children had to be taken out. And he said Mr. Carswell began the story by producing a noise like a wolf howling in the distance, which was the most gruesome thing he had ever heard. All the slides he showed, Mr. Farrow said, were most clever. They were absolutely realistic. And where he had got them, or how he worked them, he could not imagine. Well, the show went on and the stories kept on becoming a little more terrifying each time, and the children were mesmerized into complete silence. At last he produced a series which represented a little boy passing through his own park, Lufford, I mean, in the evening. Every child in the room could recognize the place from the pictures, and this poor boy was followed and at last pursued and overtaken and either torn to pieces or somehow made away with by a horrible hopping creature in white, which you saw first dodging about among the trees and gradually it appeared more and more plainly. Mr. Farrow said it gave him one of the worst nightmares he ever remembered, and what it must have meant to the children doesn't bear thinking of. Of course this was too much, and he spoke very sharply indeed to Mr. Carswell, and said it couldn't go on. All he said was, Oh, you think it's time to bring our little show to an end and send them home to their beds? Very well. And then, if you please, he switched on another slide which showed a great mass of snakes, centipedes, and disgusting creatures with wings. And somehow or other he made it seem as if they were climbing out of the picture and getting in amongst the audience. And this was accompanied by a sort of dry, rustling noise which sent the children nearly mad. And of course they stampeded. A good many of them were rather hurt and getting out of the room, and I don't suppose one of them closed an eye that night. There was the most dreadful trouble in the village afterwards. Of course, the mothers threw a good part of the blame on poor Mr. Farrer. If they could have got past the gates, I believe the fathers would have broken every window in the abbey. Well, now, that's Mr. Carswell. That's the abbot of Lufford, my dear, and you can imagine how we covered his society. 
Yes, I think he has all the possibilities of a distinguished criminal, has Carswell, said the host. I should be sorry for anyone who got into his bad books. Is he the man, or am I mixing him up with someone else? asked the secretary, who for some minutes had been wearing the frown of a man who is trying to recollect something. Is he the man who brought out a history of witchcraft some time back, ten years or more? That's the man. Do you remember the reviews of it? Certainly I do. And what's equally to the point, I knew the author of the most incisive of the lot. So did you. You must remember John Harrington. He was at John's in our time. Oh, very well indeed, though I don't think I saw or heard anything of him between the time I went down and the day I read the account of the inquest on him. Inquest? said one of the ladies. What has happened to him? Why, what happened was that he fell out of a tree and broke his neck. But the puzzle was, what could have induced him to get up there? It was a mysterious business, I must say. Here was this man, not an athletic fellow, was he, with no eccentric twist about him that was ever noticed, walking home along a country road late in the evening. No tramps about, well known and liked in the place, and suddenly he begins to run like mad, loses his hat and stick, and finally shins up a tree, quite a difficult tree, growing in the hedgerow. A dead branch gives way, and he comes down with it and breaks his neck. And there he's found next morning, with the most dreadful face of fear on him that could be imagined. It was pretty evident, of course, that he'd been chased by something. People talked of savage dogs and... Beasts escaped out of menageries, but there was nothing to be made of that. That was in 89, and I believe his brother Henry, whom I remember well at Cambridge, but you probably don't, has been trying to get on the track of an explanation ever since. He, of course, insists there was malice in it, but I don't know. It's difficult to see how it could have come in. After a time, the talk reverted to the history of witchcraft. Did you ever look into it? asked the host. Yes, I did, said the secretary. I went so far as to read it. Was it as bad as it was made out to be? Oh, in point of style and form, quite hopeless. It deserved all the pulverizing it got. But besides that, it was an evil book. The man believed every word of what he was saying, and are very much mistaken if he hadn't tried the greater part of his receipts. Well, I only remember Harrington's review of it, and I must say, if I'd been the author, it would have quenched my literary ambition for good. I should never have held my head up again. It hasn't had that effect in the present case. But come, it's half past three, I must be off. On the way home, the secretary's wife said, I do hope that horrible man won't find out that Mr. Dunning had anything to do with the rejection of his paper. Oh, I don't think there's much chance of that, said the secretary. Dunning won't mention it himself, for these matters are confidential. None of us will for the same reason. Carswell won't know his name, for Dunning hasn't published anything on the same subject yet. The only danger is that Carswell might find out if he was to ask the British Museum people who is in the habit of consulting alchemical manuscripts. I can't very well tell them not to mention Dunning, can I? It would set them talking at once. Let's hope it won't occur to him. However, Mr. Carswell was an astute man. This much is in way of prologue. On an evening rather later in the same week, Mr. Edward Dunning was returning from the British Museum, where he had been engaged in research to the comfortable house in a suburb where he lived alone, tended by two excellent women who had been long with him. There is nothing to be added by way of description of him to what we have heard already. Let us follow him as he takes his sober course homewards. A train took him to within a mile or two of his house, and an electric tram a stage farther. The line ended at a point some three hundred yards from his front door. 
He had had enough reading when he had got into the car, and indeed the light was not such as to allow him to do more than study the advertisements on the panes of glass that faced him as he sat. As was not unnatural, the advertisements in this particular line of cars were objects of his frequent contemplation, and, with the possible exception of the brilliant and convincing dialogue between Mr. Lampler and the eminent K.C. on the subject of piratic saline, none of them afforded much scope to his imagination. I am wrong. There was one at the corner of the car farthest from him which did not seem familiar. It was in blue letters on a yellow ground, and all that he could read of it was a name. John Harrington, and something like a date. It could be of no interest to him to know more, but for all that, as the car emptied, he was just curious enough to move along the seat until he could read it well. He felt to a slight extent repaid for his trouble. The advertisement was not of the usual type. It ran thus, In memory of John Harrington, F.S.A. of the Laurels, Ashbrook, died September the 18th, 1889. Three months were allowed. The car stopped. Mr. Dunning, still contemplating the blue letters on the yellow ground, had to be stimulated to rise by a word from the conductor. I beg your pardon, he said. I was looking at that advertisement. It's a very odd one, isn't it? The conductor read it slowly. Well, my word, he said. I've never seen that one before. Well, that is a cure, ain't it? Somebody been up to their jokes here, I should think. He got out a duster and applied it, not without saliva, to the pane and then to the outside. No, he said, returning. It ain't no transfer. Seems to me it was regular in the glass. What I mean in the substance, as you may say. Don't you think so, sir? Mr. Dunning examined it and rubbed it with his glove and agreed. Who looks after these advertisements and gives leave for them to be put up? I wish you would inquire. I will just take a note of the words. At this moment, there came a call from the driver. Look alive, George. Time's up. All right, all right. There's something else what's up at this end. Come and have a look at this here glass. What's going the glass? said the driver, approaching. Well, but who's Arrington? What's it all about? I was just asking who was responsible for putting the advertisements up in your cars, and saying it would be as well to make some inquiry about this one. Well, sir, sure, that's done at the company's office. That work is. It's our Mr. Timms, I believe, looks into that. When we put up tonight, I'll leave word. Perhaps I'll be able to tell you tomorrow if you happen to be coming this way. This was all that passed that evening. Mr. Dunning did just go to the trouble of looking up Ashbrook and found that it was in Warwickshire. Next day, he went to town again. The car, it was the same car, was too full in the morning to allow of his getting a word with the conductor. He could only be sure that the curious advertisement had been made away with. The close of day brought a further element of mystery into the transaction. He had missed the tram, or else preferred walking home, but at a rather late hour, while he was at work in his study, one of the maids came to say that two men from the tramways were very anxious to speak to him. This was a reminder of the advertisement, which he had, he says, nearly forgotten. He had the men in, they were the conductor and the driver of the car, and when the matter of refreshment had been attended to, he asked what Mr. Timms had had to say about the advertisement. Well, sir, that's what we took the liberty to step round about, said the conductor. Mr. Timms, he give William here the rough side of his tongue about that. According to him, there weren't no advertisement of that description sent in, nor ordered, nor paid for, nor put up, nor nothing, let alone not being there, and he was playing the fool taking up his time. Well, I says, if that's the case, all I ask of you, Mr. Timms, I says, is to take a look at it for yourself, I says. Of course, if it ain't there, I says, 
you may take and call me what you like. Right, he says, I will. And he went straight off. Now, I'll leave it to you, sir, if that ad, as we call them, with Arrington on it, weren't as plain as ever you see anything. Blue letters on yellow glass, and as I says at the time, and you borne me out, regular in the glass, because if you remember, you recollect me swabbing it with my duster. To be sure I do, quite clearly. Well, you may say, well, I don't think. Mr. Timms, he gets in that car with a light. No, he tell William to hold the light outside. Now, he says, where's your precious ad, what we heard so much about? Here it is, I says, Mr. Timms, and I laid my hand on it. The conductor paused. Well, said Mr. Dunning, it was gone, I suppose. Broken? Broke? Not it. There weren't, if you believe me, no more trace of them letters, blue letters they was, on that piece of glass than... Well, it's no good me talking. I never see such a thing. I'll leave it to William here if... But there, as I says, there's no benefit me going on about it. Well, what did Mr. Tim say? Well, he did what I gave him leave to. Called us pretty much anything he liked. And I don't know as I blame him so much neither. But what we thought, William and me did, was as we seen you take down a bit of a note about that... Well, that lettering. I certainly did that. And I have it now. Do you wish me to speak to Mr. Timms myself and show it to him? Was that what you came in about? Eh, didn't I say as much, said William. Deal with a gent if you can get on track of one, that's my word. Now perhaps, George, you'll allow I ain't took you very far wrong tonight. Very well, William, very well. No need for you to go on as if you'd had to frog march me here. I come quiet, didn't I? All the same for that, we... Had naught to take up your time this way, sir. But if it so happened you could find time to step round to the company office in the morning and tell Mr. Timms what you've seen for yourself, we should lay under a very high obligation to you for the trouble. You say it ain't been called, well, one thing and another, as we mind. But if they got into their head at the office, as we seen things that weren't there, why, one thing leads to another. And where should we be twelve months hence? Well, you can understand what I mean. Amid further elucidations of the proposition, George, conducted by William, left the room. The incredulity of Mr. Timms, who had a nodding acquaintance with Mr. Dunning, was greatly modified on the following day by what the latter could tell and show him. And any bad mark that might have been attached to the names of William and George was not suffered to remain on the company's books. But explanation? There was none. Mr. Dunning's interest in the matter was kept alive by an incident of the following afternoon. He was walking from his club to the train, and he noticed some way ahead a man with a handful of leaflets such as are distributed to passers-by by agents of enterprising firms. This agent had not chosen a very crowded street for his operations. In fact, Mr. Dunning did not see him get rid of a single leaflet before he himself reached the spot. One was thrust into his hand as he passed. The hand that gave it touched his, and he experienced a sort of little shock as it did so. It seemed unnaturally rough and hot. He looked in passing at the giver, but the impression he got was so unclear that, however much he tried to reckon it up subsequently, nothing would come. He was walking quickly, and as he went on, glanced at the paper. It was a blue one. The name of Harrington in large capitals caught his eye. He stopped, startled, and felt for his glasses. The next instant the leaflet was twitched out of his hand by a man who hurried past and was irrevocably gone. He ran back a few paces, but where was the passerby, and where the distributor? It was in a somewhat pensive frame of mind that Mr. Dunning passed on the following day into the select manuscript room of the British Museum and filled up tickets for Harley 3586 and some other volumes. After a few minutes they were brought to him, and he was settling the one he wanted first upon the desk, when he thought he heard his own name whispered behind him. He 
turned round hastily, and in doing so, brushed his little portfolio of loose papers onto the floor. He saw no one he recognized except one of the staff in charge of the room, who nodded to him, and he proceeded to pick up his papers. He thought he had them all, and was just turning to begin work, when a stout gentleman at the table behind him, who was just rising to leave, and had collected his own belongings, touched him on the shoulder, saying, May I give you this? I think it should be yours, and handed him a missing choir. It is mine, thank you, said Mr. Dunning. In another moment the man had left the room. Upon finishing his work for the afternoon, Mr. Dunning had some conversation with the assistant in charge, and took occasion to ask who the stout gentleman was. Oh, he's a man named Carswell, said the assistant. He was asking me a week ago who were the great authorities on alchemy, and of course I told him you were the only one in the country. I'll see if I can catch him. He'd like to meet you, I'm sure. For heaven's sake, don't dream of it, said Mr. Dunning. I'm particularly anxious to avoid him. Oh, very well, said the assistant. He doesn't come here often. I dare say you won't meet him. More than once on the way home that day, Mr. Dunning confessed to himself that he did not look forward with his usual cheerfulness to a solitary evening. It seemed to him that something ill-defined and impalpable had stepped in between him and his fellow men, had taken him in charge, as it were. He wanted to sit close up to his neighbors in the train and in the tram, but as luck would have it, both train and car were markedly empty. The conductor, George, was thoughtful and appeared to be absorbed in calculations as to the number of passengers. On arriving at his house, he found Dr. Watson, his medical man, on his doorstep. I've had to upset your household arrangements, I'm sorry to say, Dunning. Both your servants or de combat. In fact, I've had to send them to the nursing home. Good heavens, what's the matter? Something like tomaine poisoning, I should think. You've not suffered yourself, I could see, or you wouldn't be walking about. I think they'll pull through all right. Dear, dear, have you any idea what brought it on? Well, they tell me they bought some shellfish from a hawker at their dinner time. It's odd. I've made inquiries, but I can't find that any hawker has been to other houses in the street. I couldn't send word to you. They won't be back for a bit yet. You come and dine with me tonight, anyhow, and we can make arrangements for going on. Eight o'clock. Don't be too anxious. The solitary evening was thus obviated, at the expense of some distress and inconvenience, it is true. Mr. Dunning spent the time pleasantly enough with the doctor, a rather recent settler, and returned to his lonely home at about 11.30. The night he passed is not one on which he looks back with any satisfaction. He was in bed, and the light was out. He was wondering if the charwoman would come early enough to get him hot water next morning, when he heard the unmistakable sound of his study door opening. No step followed it on the passage floor, but the sound must mean mischief, for he knew that he had shut the door that evening after putting his papers away in his desk. It was rather shame than courage that induced him to slip out into the passage and lean over the banister in his nightgown, listening. No light was visible, no further sound came, only a gust of warm or even hot air played for an instant round his shins. He went back and decided to lock himself in his room. There was more unpleasantness, however. Either an economical suburban company had decided that their light would not be required in the small hours and had stopped working, or else something was wrong with the meter. The effect was, in any case, that the electric light was off. The obvious course was to find a match, and also to consult his watch. He might as well know how many hours of discomfort awaited him, so he put his hand into the well-known nook under the pillow. Only, it did not get so far. 
what he touched was, according to his account, a mouth with teeth and with hair about it, and he declares, not the mouth of a human being. I do not think it is any use to guess what he said or did, but he was in the spare room with the door locked and his ear to it before he was clearly conscious again. And there he spent the rest of a most miserable night, looking every moment for some fumbling at the door, but nothing came. The venturing back into his own room in the morning was attended with many listenings and quiverings. The door stood open, fortunately, and the blinds were up. The servants had been out of the house before the hour of drawing them down. There was, to be short, no trace of an inhabitant. The watch, too, was in its usual place. Nothing was disturbed. Only the wardrobe door had swung open, in accordance with its confirmed habit. A ring at the back door now announced the charwoman, who had been ordered the night before, and nerved Mr. Dunning, after letting her in, to continue his search in other parts of the house. It was equally fruitless. This is part one of the story. Please come back tomorrow to the Black Dog Chronicles for part two. Thank you for listening. Don't forget, share this story with your friends. And always, look out for the shadows. <laughs> <laughs>